Bennelong had become a marginal seat at the 2004 election. Andrew Wilkie stood against uh, John Howard, got a bit of a swing off uh, to him. If he'd, if he'd run in North Sydney, I suspect he would have won the seat on his own then. I mean, it took him two goes and he finally, he finally turned up in Denison and has, and has won a seat in his own right and he's got the balance of power. And uh, good on him, I suppose, but he could have actually made his mark in 2004 after he blew the whistle on Iraq in 2003 by taking uh, a neighbouring seat to Howard's. Howard's was a hard seat to shift, but he still did something quite interesting. He turned it into a marginal seat. So what's John Howard thinking in 2005? Well, he's looking at the Senate, the Nats all that work choices through. He's looking at his lower house. Most of them support tough asylum seeker policy. But then he looks at the electoral map and thinks, hang on, my seat's gone. So Petro George Ed did get his big win. Now, I think that this kind of lulled Labor into a false sense of security because they win the 2007 election, they take Ben along off John Howard, and they think, well, the country is where we are on this issue. Now, Labor's position has always been quite confused to me. It's bipartisan. They've always tried to match the coalition. And sometimes they flirt with the idea of going to the right of the coalition. And Paul Keating always makes this point. You could never be harsher than the Liberals on this issue. So while Labor views a variation of harshness as strength, I've never been able to work out. The idea of strength is standing for one's convictions. And if one's convictions are counter to the government's view of the day, you lose an election, but in the long run, the conviction trumps because people have, can identify with this party's uh, convictions and think, well, they'll stand for this sort of thing even when there's an electoral consequence. Now, I think Labor were able to demonstrate that with their position on Iraq, but obviously it can never demonstrate this on the position on asylum seekers. Now, this I'm giving a, uh, uh, taking all the emotion out of it. This is a straight political calculation. When a voter looks at the Labor Party, they see them all over the shop on asylum seekers. When a Conservative voter looks at the Liberal Party, they get a sense of consistency. Now, that's the context for 2010. 2010, because we've obviously jumped the 2007 election, 2010, we're coming off the back of a global recession that is as big as anything that any of us will see in our lifetime. Australia's avoided this one, as it sort of avoided the 2001 uh, global, global recession, the then the one source of the tech wreck in those days, but there were a few other countries that avoided the 2001 recession, including the UK, including Spain. We were the only ones that avoided the GSC in 2008-9, which is now called by economists around the world the Great Recession because it's the next biggest thing to the depression that economic history has to look at over the last 100 years. So you've got, even though we've escaped the GFC, you've got some of the things that started to play out in the second half of 2001 in the minds of some voters, which is this world looks like it's a mad place. There's not that much we can control. John Howard tells us he can control our borders. Hooray for that. Tony Abbott wants to control our borders. Well, I think I might think about that as an option. But the difficulty in analysing the 2010 election through the asylum seeker frame is that both parties, when they're honest with themselves, don't think that that decided the election one way or another because it was a much bigger force moving across the electoral map and that was this thing called Queensland. Now Queensland suffered the sharpest dip uh, from its position in 2007-8 at the top of the boom to the position at the other end of the GFC. It didn't quite fall into recession, but we've got some stats coming out next month which may actually show that the state was in its first technical recession for over 20 years. So if you're living in Queensland, the uh, house price differential between Brisbane and Sydney is narrowed to virtually nothing. You've made your move already. I'm going to get knocked off soon. You've made your move already and you're thinking, well, what am I doing here? The place is crowded, uh, cost of living pressures. There's not that much a political party can promise you other than revenge. Now, the coalition won nine seats in Queensland and they picked up another four in New South Wales. Roughly the same sorts of voters and a few others that were in play in 98 and 2001 came back into play in 2010. But I don't think it's... This is quite a subtle distinction. I don't think that the asylum seeker card was the thing that made it. I think it was the GFC and the difficulty a lot of people f felt in their own, uh, on their own kitchen table that forced them to uh, cast a protest vote against the Labor Party. The fact that the further south you went... Uh, that you didn't see those votes. Well, you could say that attitudes are a bit more cosmopolitan here. Actually, the economy is a little more balanced here than it is up north. I'll leave it at that and uh, invite Robert to uh, maybe contradict.
Okay, thank you all for coming um, to this event. My remarks um, give me pain, um, probably you as well, and they're addressed to, on the assumption that many people here are what I call in the talk friends of asylum seekers. I think we've reached a point of crisis, as you'll see. If it were up to me, and if I did not care about the wider political consequences, I would allow all asylum seekers who arrive spontaneously on Australia's shores to live in the community after a short period of detention for health and security checks, like Julian. I would only ask of them that they report to authority until their cases for permanent residence have been assessed by a scrupulously independent tribunal operating on the basis of strict adherence to international refugee conventions that Australia has signed. For those asylum seekers found not to be refugees, I would support their repatriation, but only when it was clear beyond any reasonable doubt that they would be safe. Unhappily, the question of asylum seeker policy cannot be rationally discussed purely on the basis of personal preference, mine or anyone else in this room. It is a complex question with a moral, legal and political dimension. I'll be stressing the moral and political. Now, I've been observing Australian attitudes to the arrival by boat of unauthorised asylum seekers since the mid-1970s, when I became president of a small lobby group called the Indochina Refugee Association. From that observation, I've arrived at certain conclusions, which I'd, I'd like to test in the panel. First is that Australian public opinion is troubled by the spontaneous arrival of asylum seekers on boats, it is not troubled by offshore government programs to resettle refugees. During the period of the Fraser government, the uninvited arrival of 2,000 Vietnamese boat, uh, asylum seekers on boats, boats caused some alarm. By contrast, the government's decision to settle more than 70,000 Indochinese refugees from the detention camps across Southeast Asia between 1978 and 1983 was more or less uncontroversial. Thirty years later this year, a Monash University study discovered that two-thirds of people had a positive attitude to refugees whose cases had been assessed by our authorities overseas. By contrast, in every opinion poll taken in 2010, almost two-thirds supported a tougher policy towards unauthorised boat asylum seeker arrivals. With spontaneous boat arrivals, the maintenance of an even remotely humanitarian policy is reliant on, I think, bipartisan political consensus, elite consensus. Fraser was only able to treat the boat arrivals humanely because the ALP opposition in general did not exploit the issue in the way it might have. The humanitarian option, which is different, broke down when Labor introduced mandatory detention in 1992. It was altogether destroyed when, prior to the 2001 election, Howard decided on an asylum seeker policy of military repulsion and indefinite detention on Nauru for those who could not be militarily repelled. The policy of the Howard government was overwhelmingly popular by every poll and estimate I've seen. Because of this, it injected a poison into the political culture whose antidote has not yet been discovered. It was also by now a thoroughly politicised issue. The question of asylum seekers was important, even perhaps vital, to Howard's 2001 election victory. It was not the only issue, and I, George and I can slog it out later. In terms of its clear deterrent objective, mandatory detention did not work, as Julian, I think, would agree. Between 1999 and 2001, 12,000 asylum seekers arrived by boat. On the other hand, military repulsion and detention on Nauru, what was called the Pacific Solution, did prove a successful deterrent. Between the institution of the Pacific Solution and its dismantling under Rudd, virtually no asylum seekers came to Australia by boat. Since the dismantling, the boats have returned. This year, there are likely to be more boat asylum seeker arrivals than in any year in Australian history. For some reason, and I'd like to discuss this, the friends of asylum seekers have resisted what seems to me a self-evident fact. 
Now, while Malcolm Turnbull was leader of the opposition, the asylum seeker issue was a headache for the Rudd government. Under Tony Abbott, an entirely unscrupulous populist conservative, it became a nightmare. Abbott understood and exploited to the full the political potential of the issue by supporting the reintroduction of temporary visas and the restoration of the Pacific Solution. In this, he had the support of about two-thirds of the Australian people. Rudd's honourable refusal to compete in what he called a race to the bottom was one of the reasons he was removed from the leadership of the Labor Party. In the words of his immigration minister, min uh, minister Chris Evans, the issue was thought by many in the, inside the Labor Party to be killing the government. During the recent election campaign, the promise to stop the boats by reinstituting the Pacific Solution was one of the three or four most important items of the Abbott election pitch. To neutralise the issue, Julia Gillard proposed the establishment of a regional processing centre in East Timor, to which asylum seekers who reach Australian territory by boat would be able to be sent to have their claims for refugee status assessed. This is best described, I think, as the Pacific solution with a human face. In my opinion, and this is where I am caused pain and probably you, the asylum seeker issue now poses an acute dilemma for Australian friends of asylum seekers. Most argue that as both mandatory detention and even more so the Pacific solution are immoral, with which I agree, the Gillard government should abolish mandatory detention and should not contemplate the establishment of an offshore processing centre on East Timor. This position is ethically right, but I've come to believe altogether unrealistic from the political point of view. Extrapolating from what we already know, if miraculously the Gillard government adopted an asylum seeker policy of the kind the Friends of the Asylum Seekers support, three things would follow. The number of asylum seekers arriving by boat would increase substantially, perhaps very substantially, in the coming years. What would you do? Julian's right. If I was an asylum seeker, I would come to a country that would accept me and not imprison me. Public opinion, which has remained extremely hostile to the spontaneous arrival of boats since 2001, would harden even further against the asylum seekers, and the government judge responsible for, for facilitating their arrival would also uh, be harmed. In such a situation, the Abbott leadership of the Liberal Party and the force of populist conservatism would be strengthened greatly, perhaps even very greatly. Now, there are major problems with the only existing alternative policy, the East Timor solution. It will prolong the uncertainty of refugees. It might fail to win the approval of the East Timorese government or people. If the asylum seekers are treated generously with regard to food, medical treatment, educational and job opportunities and so on, it might even destabilise the political situation in East Timor, one of the poorest countries on earth. If the facilities are humane and if the resettlement of those adjudged to be refugees is swift, the centre might act as a magnet of attraction for others and therefore become unmanageable. On the other hand, if these problems are avoided, the idea of the East Timor Asylum Seeker Processing Centre has possible advantages. If the asylum seekers who have been stranded in Indonesia and Malaysia for years were brought to East Timor, their chance for resettlement in a Western country might be improved, perhaps substantially. A system such as I'm suggesting is almost certain to provide an antidote to the poison that was injected into the political culture when asylum seekers became a divisive political issue, uh, especially in 2001. Fewer boats would certainly arrive. If they did arrive, those on board would be taken to East Timor for processing. It seems likely that the responsibility of resettlement of these people would then fall mainly on Australia. In such a situation, it is not impossible that a humane Australian government could agree to settle a, general, a generous annual quota of those in East Timor judged to be refugees. And they should be, if, if that was such a system, 
resettled according to the date of their arrival, including in Indonesia, where people have been stranded for years. It is not even impossible that the government might, in this case, be able to increase its annual quota uh, from the present 13,750 to something like 20,000 places, now advocated by groups on the left, like the Greens, while still retaining the support of majority Australian opinion, as the Fraser government was able to do in regard to the resettlement of the Indo-Chinese refugees between 78 and 83, because that kind of policy does not spook the Australian opinion. What, this is where I conclude. It seems to me that friends of asylum seekers are now faced with a real Sophie's choice. They can maintain their support for a policy, the end of mandatory detention, the rejection of the East Timor solution, which is morally compelling, which is almost certain to be rejected by any Australian government we can imagine, but which, if adopted, would lead to an increase in spontaneous boat arrivals and would therefore almost certainly strengthen the electoral prospects, prospects of the political right. Or they can choose to, to support a policy centred on the idea of the regional processing centre on East Timor, which is deeply morally uncomfortable and troubling, which is clearly more politically realistic, but which, from the policy point of view, may even be unrealisable. To adopt the language, or to adapt, I should say, the language of Max Weber, friends of asylum seekers are now caught between a morally pure ethic of absolute ends and a more politically realistic ethic of responsibility. They are obliged, or we are obliged, to find a passage through what has become an ethical, legal and political minefield. In the case of asylum seeker policy, there are for us no longer easy and even morally easy options. Thank you. As I said at the beginning, um, I would like first of all to get some discussion on the panel. I think um, as we've sat and listened, it's become clear that there are rather different both interpretations and, and policy outcomes from what each of the speakers have said. Um, so if you will bear with me, I might ask Julian and then Marilyn and George, um, and then finally Robert, who has after all just spoken, uh, to comment on each other's. And then if we have time, we'll throw it open to some short questions. So Julian? Yeah, I, I, can I start by saying I think Robert's position is a, a very courageous one because I know it goes against your moral instincts to be suggesting something that is at the f on the face of it not very palatable. I wanted to pick up on a couple of things though because um, numbers are a really important element in determining what's possible. Um, then there's a question of methods. Um, you said that between 99 and 2001, if I heard correctly, that 12,000 boat people arrived here. I think that's incorrect. Um, my, my understanding of the figures is that 2001 saw 4,000, and that was a, an all-time high, and the longest-term average is about 800 to 1,000 per year over the life of the Howard government. Um, you're shaking your head. Well, there, there's but, an excellent parliamentary pa paper, parliamentary library paper on this, which I did yeah. check all the figures. Was this boat people or boat asylum people. seekers? Boat people. Mm. It's 99, 2000, 2001, yeah, but and it I, comes to 12,000. I, I don't think there was 4,000 in each of those three years. But in any event, um, um, we, we can, I guess we can check somewhere. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's a while since I checked the department's figures. The other thing is, um, you're saying that the, there's an acute dilemma because the, um, the sort of uh, friends of asylum seekers uh, approach would um, in effect be a pull factor, in effect increase the numbers substantially. Um, and that involves an assumption that um, the deterrent measures operate to reduce the numbers. Now it's all contestable, but I, I'm prepared to assume you're right on the causation element. But the question is how many people are ever likely to come here, even if you add that we act decently? Um, and and I, I, I do think the danger of the voyage is probably the most significant deterrent. Uh, you know, I mean, hundreds of people have died trying to come. 
it's pretty clear that the people who do get here that way are pretty desperate. Um, and so I wonder, are we ever likely to see really big numbers of the sort that European countries get? Now, uh, to put it in perspective, um, our annual migration intake, if our annual migration intake of recent years were represented by the number of people in this room, this year's boat arrivals would involve one extra person coming into the room. You know, on, on any view, demographically, it's a very small number. Now, if that in increased to an additional four or five people coming into the room, demographically, it would not be a problem, and you could always adjust the migration intake, as we seem to do year after year. Um, the, the real key to it is, can we get some sort of political management of the public reactions? Because actually, when you look at the facts, I don't understand what people are frightened about. Um, now, I know that politics is a difficult area, it's not my field, but I would be reluctant to go along with your theory be simply because we assume it is too hard to persuade politicians to do the right thing and to actually lead rather than stir up fear and then follow. You know, we've slipped for the last few years into the Jim Hacker style of leadership, which says, I'm their leader, I must follow them. You know, they, they check the news polls and then they say, OK, we'll do that. That's, that seems to me not a good way to run a country. Can I stop you on that point? Because I'd mm. like to get Meryl and George's response. Then I'm going to give Robert a quick response and then we'll throw it open. Yeah, I completely agree with Julian because um, I wrote a biography of Faith Bandler a while ago uh, who was one of the national leaders of the referendum in 67 um, on Aboriginal rights. And... I was really persuaded in writing that. She worked for about 10 years to bring that referendum and the yes vote about. How absolutely important her moral and eloquent leadership was. You know, she was, fan she was charismatic and she was a fantastic speaker. And I also, th I agree with Julian in that I actually still think, you know, I'm an optimist, I still think if we had moral, eloquent, political leadership that actually put those facts before people, um, that we still should, you know, cling to that hope that that will persuade people that there's nothing um, that is so fearful. I mean, I think the continuity here with, with Deakin and democratic government in 1888 is precisely Deakin's perception that with the advent of democracy in the Australian colonies, in Victoria, which was completely novel in the world at that stage, you know, relatively, and he could see, you know, mob rule posed a new political problem altogether, and, that, and he caved into it. That was his choice. He was quite aware of what he was doing. Um, I also think that what not so much scares people but what really annoys people about uninvited asylum seekers arriving across the water is that sense, which is why I emphasise sovereignty, is that sense that the Australian people, which John Howard captured really well, want to think they're in charge. You know, like, we're in charge, we're going to say who comes, get in the queue, you know, whatever language they use, but we have to be in charge of this. So I think so long as we explain a process in which we're still in charge, but it's rational and fair, and it's very interesting, the figure that there's a much higher percentage um, of those who come as you know, boat people who are successful in claiming refugee status. Um, I think if we can persuade people that we're actually in charge of that, that's our policy, you know, it's not being foisted on us by these people who come uninvited, then, yes, I think that should be... I think we need more eloquent moral leadership. I'm not asking you for eloquent moral leadership necessarily, <laughs> but I'm asking for a response. Two things. One, I, I don't think the electorate view on this is set in stone. I don't think this is one of those places where a government or an opposition, depending on who's in power and who isn't, uh, can't change the public's mind. That's the first point I make. And the reason why I make that now, and that's the second point coming out of the election we've just seen, which was the most awful campaign in anyone's corporate memory. It was the absence of, of, of any, uh, any sense of where either party wanted to take the country. Right? It was the absence of a call for a positive mandate that hung the parliament. So I think we're in a quite rare headspace now where the first person who stands up and says, here's what I believe and here's what's good for the country, may actually get 
a bit of a switch. And these switches are only at the margin anyway. Remember, what we were talking about in 2001 was taking an 8% primary vote from, from one nation, halving that to 4% and transferring that 4% across the coalition column to decide an election that the coalition thought they would lose. Not just on the asylum seeker issue, but you know, these are pretty narrow, narrow cast transactions. Now, what the Labor Party found in the election just been, where they lost their majority, but the people didn't want to embrace a change of government, so they hung the parliament, was that there's actually a bigger group to their left now than how it ever had to contend with to his right on, um, on uh, when, when, when Hanson was running a mark. So you had the coalition primary and the Hanson primary in 98, you don't get to 50%. But if you do add the Labor and the Green primary in 2010, you do get to 50%. So... A lot of things. A lot of things are, uh, are obvious for the benefit of hindsight. But Labor would have been much better placed in this debate if a they didn't take the hit in two thousand and one. Didn't feel they need to. Uh, and I'm making a political assessment here. Again, I want to take the emotion out of it. If Labor didn't uh, didn't allow itself to be to be hoodwinked in two thousand and one, and then when they had power in two thousand and seven, had a good idea of what it is they wanted to do with it when the boats came back. And clearly that was the failure of leadership with Kevin Rudd. He didn't have another system in place. And he had a mandate for another system because, remember, John Howard lost Benelong in 2007. And any Labor spinner could interpret that as a cosmopolitan protest vote. So you could have done anything with that mandate. And the reason why we're looking at a hung parliament is that Labor didn't lead on a number of issues. They've got a second chance, I think, but that's only because the uniqueness of the hung parliament, Tony Windsor and Rob Oakeshott are pro-asylum seeker, amongst other things. Robert, do you want to make a quick response now? Um, yeah. Is that, is that yes. all right? I'm, I'm absolutely in your power, so. uh, but a short one. Well, the other possibility that I'm, if you're happy with this, is we'll allow a couple of very short comments or questions then give all of the panel... Well, perhaps I could say something about yeah. Julian and Marilyn yeah. very briefly. Um, I, think, I think the opposition to boat arrivals is is insane and distressing. I also don't believe that either the death of Rupert Murdoch and the end of the horrible News Limited or political leadership can easily change the attitude. And I think it's strange because I think uh, even more than Marilyn, I think the weight of history is very real. And that Australians, I don't think, are in any sense, obvious sense racist anymore as they once were. And I don't think, and I know from the polls, they don't oppose refugees. Uh, they, they, that's what they say. They do oppose the uncontrolled nature of boat arrivals. I think that goes very deep. And I, I don't think that it's a lack of moral leadership that leads to that. I think it is very deep in the national psyche. And I think it was actually even there before Tampa. I think Howard was late in the piece and that, that he got onto something, and I think there's a poison now in the political culture to which we haven't found the antidote. I think that, to be honest, if, if Labor allowed boats to continue to arrive, and, and, and in particular also scrap mandatory detention, which they'd have to. Mandatory detention cannot work for thousands of people. It's a nightmare. Indefinite mandatory Yeah, inde yeah. indefinite mandatory detention. And I, I, think, I think Labor would be very imperiled at the next election. I, I think it is now a really difficult problem for Australia. Other countries in Europe have Muslim questions as their problems. This is our one. And it's for these reasons that it's, it's a message of defeat I have, but I, it's a message that I, I need very, I think, has to be argued very carefully. The question is, can, so, I, can so, I just respond? No, because I'm going to stop you, all of you. <laughs> very this strong is, chair. The water's behind you, Marilyn. Mm -hmm. this, this is where being a chair becomes an act of, of pure bravado. Um, I'm going to allow three very quick questions or comments, and I am quite ruthless. I'm not ruthless, but these guys up here, I will be with you. Okay, stand up because the acoustics are terrible. We've got a mic coming to you. And... Very briefly, and then I will give the panel a chance to, to respond to the three comments or questions. Sure. Well, my name's Daniel and I'm a student here. I'm also an activist in the uh, refugee rights campaign. The thing that I disagree with Robert Mann on uh, is that you seem to take public opinion towards asylum seekers and arrivals as a fixed quantity. And I think there's a lot of evidence from uh, Australian history and recent history that shows that uh, these kinds of fears can be overcome. 
Um, you look, for example, Daniel, attitudes towards the war in Afghanistan. Question, not, a, not a speech. Oh, sure. Well, the argument I, I think we need, to, we need to wage with the Australian community is that they need to change their views towards arrivals. I don't think we can make concessions to the fear. I think we need to take a stand, and I think that's what courage is. And I think that's the kind of friendship that asylum seekers need. Um, it's why we've got to wage the argument. If we lose it, well, we've got to wage it. Okay, do we have... Anyone else who... There were quite a few hands, and I said I'd take three, and I'm going to have to be ruthless. So at the back, and then over here, and I'm sorry, sorry, but I have no choice. Um, yeah, my... Well, I'm also a student here, an activist for refugee rights on campus, as well as for students for Palestine. Um, and my question is, as well, that um, Australia has a history of racist policies, and mandatory detention in itself is a racist policy. And you look at the numbers of boat arrivals that come here, and it shows that the amount of millions and millions of dollars that we invest into mandatory detention doesn't make sense, the amount of arrivals. And I think what we need to address as well is not just the ideas that people have, but the media in itself constructs these fears. And governments play up on it because it's an easy way into the elections that you look at 2001 and 2010. Um, and I think the argument here is why Labor lost the votes, is because it didn't take on a left-wing trajectory that took up in a stance in supporting refugee rights. And I think there is an avenue in there, and I think you guys could address that aspect of it. OK, we have one last comment from you, and then it'll be over to the panel. It's going to be on a similar theme. My name's Owen. You picked the three Trotskyists in the room. Uh, <clears throat> I, I just, okay, I want to keep it brief. I just want to say I, I disagree with Robert because I think that the formulation that he put forward is actually capitulating to the right before you're having the argument. So it's saying that, well, if we actually win a left-wing demand, then the right will be emboldened by it. So in order to not let the right be emboldened, we need to capitulate to the right and actually accept this horrible process of, of offshore detention. There's been a few mentions of, you know, eloquent, courageous moral leadership, but I don't think that we're going to actually see it from politicians. I think it's these friends of refugees in this room right here, actually, who are going to provide it. So I just want to say, Robert, that, you know, that, that politically, you know, it's a, it's a wrong policy because it demobilises people, but actually the people who can actually make a difference and start to build a movement that will provide that eloquent leadership are standing in this, are sitting in this room, I'm standing, um, and that the first step for it is a demonstration uh, that you've all got the things for, so I hope to see you all there. Thank you. This demonstration has been plugged sufficiently. <laughs> there will be no more plugs for the demonstration, unless, of course, Julian chooses to use his right of reply um, to marshal the troops. Um, look, I apologise for this, but I'm very conscious of the fact we need to end at 5 to 2, um, and it is only right and proper to ask the panel now to have some last comments, and I will do it in the reverse order uh, in which they spoke. Um, so, Robert... Well, to the three Trotskyists and to many others, um, I don't for a minute think what you're doing is wrong. In fact, for years, as Julian knows, I was involved in as much advocacy as I could. And I, d and I don't for a minute think that opinion is fixed for certain. And I think advocates and uh, activists should be doing all they can to argue the moral case. I was trying to give a political analysis. I actually think... I suppose one thing that is important to me is that I'm linked to mainstream politics. And I, I believe it's extremely important that it, in its present post-Howard state, the coalition does not rule. And I am very fearful that the coalition may rule on issues like this. And I think it is very important that I think there's an opportunity now to push the political culture in a post-Howard direction because Labor will have to rely on the Greens in the Senate from next July. And I think it's possible that opinion might even shift on the asylum seeker issue. Well, I think that would be one of the hardest. I think on climate change, it's much more hopeful. But anyhow, I don't want to say I to, I'm not trying to discourage moral activism and moral vision. But I'm trying to give a political analysis from what I think to be a reasonably realistic point of view from someone who believes it, and is still within the mainstream. George. I think whoever won the election and... Uh, it came down to the two New South Wales independents in the end. But I think whoever won the election had to demonstrate control before they could address public opinion. And one of the reasons we're having this debate again, and it was one of the reasons 
strangely that we were having them in 2001, because John Howard did not have control of the borders in 2001 until he escalated. Um, with the confrontation with the Tampa and then the uh, introduction of the Pacific Solution. Neither party actually has a policy that, that establishes control of this, uh, of, of, uh, this question. And before they, can work that, before they can address public opinion, they need to, they need to make something work. Now, um, the hypothetical I'll pose here, if, if Nauru does sign uh, the, uh, the uh, UN protocol, then what we might have is Julia Gillard telling Tony Abbott, well, it's no different to East Timor, let's use both. And if Tony Abbott says, no, let's just do Nauru, she might then say to him, well, hang on a minute, you're just being bloody minded, mate. Um, Nauru is on the same page as East Timor, and I'd like to use the two of them. It's just a hypothetical, but uh, I think the uh, I think a policy needs to demonstrate some sense of consistency before we address uh, public opinion. Okay, a couple of points. First of all, um, if the question is border control, again, I think the numbers are an important consideration. This year, it will have about 5,000 unauthorised arrivals, but the number of authorised arrivals in Australia this year is about four and a half million. Now, anyone who thinks that that's a lack of border control is just on a different planet. You know, I, I, calling a border control is just alarmism. And unfortunately, not enough people are calling the politicians on their gross distortion of the facts. Second, after the three quasi-questions, I do feel inclined to support Robert. I, I need, to, need to defend him. I don't like to see an underdog being attacked. Um, I actually think... I actually think the regional processing idea in East Timor is capable of working. It all depends on the detail. And one of the crucial, what well, the two crucial elements would be they have to be treated decently there and uh, the process has to be conspicuously fair. But secondly, there has to be a guarantee of resettlement quickly. You can't simply warehouse them there the way we did in Nauru, uh, waiting for other countries in the world to put up their hand. But if, if resettlement is uh, going to be immediately available to people, mainly in Australia, I suspect, and why not, um, then that may make the whole solution politically acceptable to the public. It's just a, a, a roundabout way of doing it. Um, so as long as those conditions were satisfied, I wouldn't be implacably opposed to the East Timor approach. Um, the third thing is, and perhaps this is the most fundamental point, um, Whilst I understand Robert's political analysis, is it, are we a community that is prepared to say, oh, well, the public at large have terrible moral views, so we'll just roll on with that. You know, we're, we can't do anything about it, so let's just cop it sweet. I, I have real trouble accepting that. I still believe that the Australian public are basically decent. They can be persuaded to see things differently if they get the facts. And the real trick is to get the politicians to acknowledge what the true facts are. Because if they do, then I think they will start to lead instead of simply following populist, misconceived ideas. Uh, yes, well, I agree with that position. Um, I talked about historical legacies, and there are clearly historical legacies. But I'm not clear about um, Robert's notion of a national psyche. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure what that is. And I do believe that attitudes can change. And I think clearly one reason, you know, this is not um, an original thought, that such a large vote went over to the Greens, uh, you know, defecting from the Labor Party, is precisely the perception that um, Bob Brown offers leadership um, in this domain. So um, I think we shouldn't capitulate and that we indeed should seek to persuade the public that we're in control, that we're in charge of this, that, that, that we will have a processing system you know, that is fair. Um, I mean, whether that's done through East Timor or whether it's done on the mainland, I guess East Timor might be more acceptable to people. Um, and I also think it would be wonderful if Julian Burnside was a politician. <laughs> Forget it. Thank you. Can, can I just say to those of you who didn't have a chance to speak, and to those of you I made sit down, I share your frustration. I've also sat here for an hour and a half not being able to express any of my views on this issue, but I do want to thank you for being a very attentive audience, particularly to thank um, our speakers. I think that what this panel has done is, I hope, open up a discussion 
that will continue for a long time. And I know that um, when Robert and I talked about this yesterday, we both felt that this was an important event, not so much because there were only four people speaking today, but because we need to, to think very seriously about political strategies for how we take these issues forward. And that was what today I hope really has achieved. So thank you very much. I think some of the panel will stay around briefly so you can come and speak to them. Um, and let's thank our speakers in the normal accustomed way.